Our first speaker uh, will be uh, Professor Marisa Forster uh, from the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa, who's going to provide the clinical setting for why we're all here, um, give us a clinical background, clinical practice for um, uh, targeted alpha therapy. So uh, please. Yeah. And before she starts, I understand that some of the speakers have still not sent their slides um, to um, the BIPM for presentation. Remember, you can't present from a USB stick. Um, so if you have not sent your uh, your slides in and you're a speaker, please make sure that you do that. Yeah, you can speak directly. Okay. It's just about to hide it. Uh, I'm telling you. I'm iPhone. iPhone's here. Yes. Okay. It's moving, yeah? Right. Yeah. Perfect. You can hit. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, yeah. Good morning, everyone. Um, firstly, I'd just like to thank this, the uh, organizers for this wonderful opportunity. Um, I think it's only fitting that we speak about such a scintillating subject in <clears throat> what is the City of Light. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity and this invitation. I'm a nuclear medicine physician, and I'm from South Africa, head of the department in Durban. Um, and it excites me very much to speak about targeted alpha therapy. I'm a severe introvert, so if I get invited, I only speak if I really am passionate about something. So the fact that I'm here um, speaks to that. So just to, um, to give you an outline, which I've already had a sneak preview to. So I'll just start with some of the background and basics, and then talk about where we are at present, which are some of the role players, and what do I think the future holds for this? And so if we look at the publications on targeted alpha therapy, you can see if you look at that, that yellow line on the left, um, that there's been a marked increase, almost an explosion from 2010 to 2015. And that graph only goes up to 2020. If you continue here, you can see that in the past four or five years, there's almost a thousand publications per year, which just tells you how important this is. And so just to take a step back and speak about theranostics, which we all know very well by now, um, this combination of seeing something before you treat it and then following it up with the same imaging mechanism. And of course, that imaging mechanism is also important to provide your dose symmetry and to see whether you are winning or not. So should you treat, change your treatment or should you continue in the same way? So I'm going to speak a lot about actinium PSMA because that gives a very good example of how it really works well. And you can see that we first need a target that's expressed on the cancer cell. So the more specific to a cancer this can be, obviously the better, because then you don't get all of the side effects. So for prostate cancer, we know that PSMA works really well, and that is, ex is, is, is expressed far more than in a normal prostate cancer cell. And the more aggressive it gets and the higher the Gleason score is, the more you get this expression of the PSMA which makes it really an ideal target. And now we send something to that target, whether it be an antibody or a peptide or a folic acid, and we linked, link it to our chosen radiopharmaceutical, whether it be diagnostic or therapeutic. And just to highlight again that that imaging before helps us to select which patients should we treat, yes or no. So if you look at this image um, of a patient with PSMA, gallium PSMA, you can see the normal biodistribution. And even though this patient is exactly like this one, also diagnosed with prostate cancer, high PSA, you can see that by imaging, this one would not benefit from targeted alpha therapy, whereas this one is ideal. Again, thinking about that micrometastases and diffuse metastases, um, this is an ideal candidate versus this one. So then it helps us to guide and to send the patient rather for chemotherapy or alternative forms of therapy. 
So now before we treat, we have to take into consideration a few aspects. Um, if we, I'm just simplifying it very much here. If we want uh, to treat a small tumor like I just showed or diffuse or micrometastases, we tend to go for the alpha particle. Whereas if we want to treat something slightly bigger, maybe soft tissue, we'll go for the beta particle. And then obviously the imaging is related to the gamma ray. But now we have to match it in terms of what are we targeting. So the two half-lives are important to, ma to match them. You can imagine if you take an antibody, which has a very long half-life, it won't quite make sense to label it to something with quite a short half-life. Um, also the chelator, taking into account um, how we can minimize the side effects and the off-target effects, the half-life, as I said, and whether this, this is going to be internalized into the tumor cell, yes or no. Um, if it is not, you need a far more potent therapy. Uh, just to show that a bit. Okay, and obviously we want the double DNA stranded breaks. So with the alpha particle, we get the double stranded DNA breaks within the tumor, which makes it far more difficult for this tumor to recover. If you only break it a single strand or a base, then the tumor can somehow find ways of regrouping and recovering and recurring, and that we want to avoid. So obviously we want the double DNA stranded breaks. So looking at this a little bit closer, um, an alpha, as we know, gives that punch of energy over a very short um, distance, and that is more or less in the region of 100 kilo electron volt per micrometer. And if you consider um, comparing that to a beta particle, which gives you 0.2, and I think in a boxing match, this would be my um, ad almost, if I, if I was an alpha particle, 8,000 times bigger and three to seven times more damaged biologically. And then if you look at the Auger electron, obviously it can't go very far, it's just um, around the cell membrane. Then just to highlight also that we get the direct effects from the radiation at the cell level, but there's also indirect effects, um, interactions with water causing, radio, um, causing um, free radicals, and also a bystander effect and a crossfire effect. So the longer your rays are, the more other tumor cells in the vicinity you can, you can target. Um, and then there's also what we call the abscopal effect. So you treat the tumor, but some of the distant metastases also respond. And, and why is that? And that is a complicated immunological reaction. So lots of um, um, immune factors get released, and they cause a similar tumor regressing factor um, response in, in other tumors that are not even close to where you treat it. So these are some of the things that happen at the tumor level. And so, of course, the major advantage of the alphas also is that once you've had resistance, like I explained before with the single-stranded DNA breaks, you can get some recovery, and then um, it becomes resistant. So now you can treat with the alpha, alpha emitter. You get a greater abscopal effect, which I just explained. It's not dependent on oxygen, so it doesn't become resistant because there is no oxygen. And also, it's not dependent on the cell cycle of the tumor. And so if we look at where can we find now these... Um, targeted um, these alpha emitters. Those are basically our options. And then, of course, we need something that goes well in terms of the diagnosis. Well, how can we image? Um, and the one that's really naturally seems to be perfect is the lead one. So to image and to, to treat. And then, of course, the terbium, terbium isotopes, also very versatile, the 149, which I'll just get to a little bit later. And so if we look at what, which kind of trials are happening at the moment, you can see that there are so many. The tables just continue. Um, I'm not going to speak about them too much, but to highlight that the ones that are favored in terms of the radioisotope are the actinium-225, the lead-212, and astatine 211 And also what seems to be the vector here is PSMA, HER2, somatostatin receptors on neuroendocrine, um, insulin growth-like factor, and CD33. So those seem to be the major ones. And they, of course, we get them in metastatic um, gastroid-resistant prostate cancer, breast cancer, ovarian, gastric, uh, neuroendocrine tumors, and lymphoma. And so I've, I've tried to make them a bit more personal, and, and, and given the audience maybe thought that you would appreciate this bunch. Um, yeah, so I think, so from what I mentioned now, the astatine, the lead, 
Bismuth 2 and 3. Actinium we know has a good track record now. Uh, thorium 227, radium 223 as it's FDA approved, and then also terbium 149. So I'll look at them in a little bit more detail. So if we look at actinium, yeah, of course we have an excellent track record. Um, and, and I'll show some of the clinical examples we have by now. The problem is, of course, the four alphas that are emitted in that recoil energy. Um, sorry, I'll get to that now. And just to show you that recoil energy, how potent it is and how much it can, in a covalent binding, really overcome that and cause daughters that are drifting everywhere that we can't quite measure. We don't know what the toxicity effects are, and we can't do the dosimetry properly. So I would say that that is the major problem with actinium-225. And we can image it, as you know, we have these two photon emissions, 440 and 218, and I'll also show you an example of that just a bit later. Um, but the groundwork was really done by the Heidelberg group, who um, determined the dose for us. We know we can give 100 kilo becquerel per kilogram. And then also they, they gave us this wonderful swimmer's plot where you can see the dark green, if I, if I can get you to focus on the dark green, shows you the actinium PSMA. And this is where it happened in the treatment landscape. So you can see that most of these patients were treated before with abiraterone, insulutamide, docetaxel. So right at the end, someone decided, let's try actinium PSMA. And you can see that even with this unlevel playground, where it was the very last resort, nothing else worked. You still got a remarkable progression-free and overall survival. You added months of life, good quality life to these patients' lives, even as the very last resort. And so now it would make sense to, to level the playing ground a little bit more and bring actinium earlier. And so what we did when I was still based in Pretoria was to look at patients who had not had any therapy. So these are patients who didn't qualify for chemotherapy or who declined it. So and if you look at this example, which is quite striking, you have a patient with a PSA of 782, and at this picture, widespread meds, every single bone is involved. And then after one cycle, this improvement, another cycle, and you can see that after four cycles, um, in the space of less than a year, that, that PSA has dropped from 782 to 0 0.04, and there is really nothing left. So this is quite remarkable. Um, also, what I wanted to demonstrate with this slide is that we, in Pretoria, we used to, we, we de-escalated the dose. So if you find a patient like this, you would start with, let's say, 8 or 9 megabecquerel, and then you de-escalate in an attempt. So for this one, you give 7, 6, and so, so on, in an attempt to spare the salivary glands and to get less toxic effects. Um, just the results of this study, then you can see there's a huge difference. So the ones who had had nothing before had a 92% decrease in tumor markers versus the ones who were heavily pre-treated. Then also bringing it closer in another sense, um, to most patients start with androgen deprivation therapy, almost all of them. And then if you bring it out just after this setting to see how would patients do there, you can see again there's a remarkable response. 91% of patients had any response. And undetectable in one out of three, that is quite amazing. And so this is just to make the case for where should this therapy be given in the treatment landscape? We still do not quite know. Um, right at the end, it seems to work, but bringing it easy, um, earlier also seems to work. So we need to find out which patients we should treat when um, in combination with what still. Um, another setting where it's even patients who are still hormone sensitive um, and you can see that, again, we got a brilliant response there, 95% of any decline, an undetectable PSA in four. So a median progression-free survival of nine months and 50% still alive at nearly three months later. So we are also starting to get that long-term um, outcomes. And the first reports of five-year outcomes are now also coming to light. And then we can also use it in various hopeless situations, which we have done. Uh, if you look at this patient, there is lung metastases everywhere. So traditionally, this kind of patient would just be sent home because there really is nothing to do. Um, and if you look at the second image, you can see that that is now mostly gone. 
Um, and that was after one cycle of actinium PSMA. Um, similarly, in this patient with the brain metastases, if you cannot resect it, which is often the case, um, those patients are sent home with no alternatives. And again, in this patient, we treated once and got the brain metastases to disappear. And so when you, when you see this, um, it really makes you think that it's just the best thing since sliced bread. If only it was as readily available and as cheap. And so to get more to the, to the normal clinical situation, we would look at a patient, we would image, and then start to decide, are there any contraindications to treatment, yes or no? So first we image, and if there is expression, we want this to be more intense than the liver. If you look at this image, for example, the uptake uh, is far more intense than what you see in the liver. And this kind of candidate responds well to therapy. So then we start looking at the bone marrow because we expect toxicity there. So if already the patient is compromised, we need to take that into account. And then the kidney functions, of course. So we look at kidney functions, imaging, and the bone marrow. And this is just the clinical, um, looking at the patient's clinical performance, how well are they. And so in our setting, we, we looked at if it's predominantly skeletal, we would go for actinium PSMA because we had both options. And then if it was more soft tissue, lutetium PSMA. But this is not always the case. Um, so in my new new department in Albert Latuli Hospital, you can see this patient has a huge amount of large lymph nodes in the abdomen and in the pelvis. And he received eight cycles of lutetium PSMA before. And so then we gave one cycle of actinium. And you can see there's a remarkable response from there to there. And then this leads us to combining these two therapies in multiple tandem approaches. And this has been done by several groups, and you can do it in many ways. So you can start, for example, with a full dose of actinium, eight, and then with the next cycle, de-escalate to six, four, etc. And then you can go the opposite way with the lutetium. Or you can do the, there are so many combinations and possibilities in this regard. And this is also in an attempt to overcome resistance and also to minimize this, the toxicity, which we see in the salivary glands mostly. Okay, so now we have lots of evidence accumulating to the point where we can now do meta-analysis. Um, and I found four recent ones in the literature. All of them have just over 200 patients. Unfortunately, they overlap quite a bit. So you get the same studies being included according to the quality criteria. And they basically all found an excellent response. And the main side effect of xerostomia, in, depending what you look at, but 70 to 80% of patients will get the xerostomia, the dry mouth. And there is um, not yet a good answer for that. Um, in a similar study recently, which was published in the Lancet Oncology, um, seven centers, part of warmth, were included with all of their patients to date. Um, and they found very similar results. So, Progression-free survival, which was in the meta-analysis more or less around nine months, um, is slightly shorter with this study, seven months. And then overall survival tends to be over a month if you look at all these meta-analyses, but was longer with the WARM study, around 15, 15 months. But we agree that xerostomia is the major side effect, um, and you can also get some nephrotoxicity and bone marrow toxicity. Uh, yes, coming to that. So... And nephrotoxicity, around 5% over five years if you combine the uh, available data. But this is, the nephrotoxicity is estimated from the external beam radiation therapy um, data that we have. So we're looking at a 23 gray maximum dose to the kidneys, which is really not the same if you're using something that you inject IV and which is over time multiple doses. So there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of nephrotoxicity. And we can handle this um, fairly well by adding um, amino acids that block reabsorption in the kidneys, and that decreases the levels to a third in the circulating, um, in the circulating blood and in the kidneys. So then I just wanted to mention that there's also quite a, quite a bit of work in endocrine, endocrine tumors that are um, impressive, where we can use actinium dototite. And now it seems like lead is coming into the picture, where with this recent study, the authors say that um, has the potential to improve the efficacy 
and with a significantly lower toxicity profile, which is all, always important. <clears throat> this is also something we did um, that I was very proud of last year. Uh, we treated a patient with differentiated thyroid cancer, which usually responds quite well to iodine, but this patient didn't have iodine uptake anymore and had no alternatives left. We couldn't give her the next best therapy. And so we just treated a young lady, 29 year old. Um, she had multiple lung mates. And then after just this one cycle of actinium dotatide, you can see that, um, that brilliant response. And so, of course, I <laughs> am out of my depth when I speak about this. You are um, the experts in this. But just to say that this is really tricky. Um, so if it's going to be a tedious thing where we need Monte Carlo simulations and probability curves and it takes days to get an answer, uh, we really need something that's an imaging um, imaging answer. So something where we can say, because it looked like this on gallium PSMA, we expect the dosimetry to be X on, on the actinium. So something that's simple to translate. And we did try to image, um, I'm not gonna highlight all of the issues with that, you know that very well, but we try to image actinium PSMA after therapy and because it's that low dose, we don't get the counts as expected. And because it takes so long, we cannot also get the kidneys and the salivary glands into the picture. It's just not feasible. Um, but as you can see, we did images and we did compare it to our gallium PSMA images before. And it, it does, with a little bit of imagination, you can see that. <clears throat> and I thought at this point it would be appropriate to just take a short movie break. Um, this is a video just reminding us that how this works in the body. This is on lutetium, but the principle is really very much um, the same. So we have the nuclear physician as an outpatient procedure, just giving a short injection. Goes to the tumor, which is highly vascularized. Gives radiation and then it starts shrinking. the receptor, it goes into the cell, is internalized, and then detonates. Awesome, right? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, with lutetium, we have that added effect of seeing seeing the images to know that it went where we wanted it to go, and then we do the dosimetry. Okay, so after the movie break, then um, the next the next contender is bismuth two and three. Of course, if you think about the image of the year, I remember this very well in twenty twelve. Quite remarkable, where this group of patients with neuroendocrine tumors that didn't respond to anything else was now uh, injected into the hepatic artery um, by Kratochville and colleagues. And you can see from this image, look at these huge liver metastases and then the wonderful response afterwards. And so this made us think that bismuth is probably then the next best thing. Unfortunately, the half-life makes it very difficult. It's, it's too short. At least we have no recoil. Um, but taking now the half-life into consideration, now we should consider maybe labeling it to something like FAPI, which also doesn't stay long in the tumor, um, connecting those two, and start considering regional approaches. So into the, into the brain, into the, for gliomas or into the bladder, any confined cavity that we can directly inject it into. Uh, other concerns are, is the renal, to renal toxicity and the amount that you're going to need um, as it's from actinium, that in vivo generator effect. 
And so to date, more than 200 patients have been treated successfully with leukemia, lymphoma, melanoma, bladder, as I said, lioma, and neuroendocrine tumors. Um, but it does seem to be better suited to a, a localized approach. If we look at some of the, the ongoing clinical studies, you can see them there. And then just a reminder that how, if the this, if this size of the molecule is big, it'll stay longer in the blood and it'll be taken up more into the tumor. And therefore, you'll also get more radiotoxicity. On the other end, the bigger it is, the poorer your target to blood ratio becomes and your imaging possibilities decrease. So next, we have radium-223, firstly, first approved by the FDA in 2013. Um, unfortunately, only goes to bone. If you look at this bottom image, goes to the bone. It's very much like a calcium, um, goes to the hydroxyapatite crystals and works there. So since it only goes to bone, now we have to consider combining it with other therapies. We have a half-life of 11.4 days and side effects mostly um, are related to the GIT and to the bone marrow. We could also consider treating something like bone tumors, which are um, relatively radio-resistant, but, but could possibly respond to this. And so now there's an ongoing study just to look at the long-term effects, because we don't quite know what, what is the incidence now of secondary malignancies. Um, and this is the first result should be in this year. It's a multi-center multi study, observational um, looking at the incidence of, of secondary cancers, um, and that should be available soon. Now, there's also, uh, it's been accepted into the guidelines. There's an EANM guideline, uh, sorry, that, that's to show you which, which therapies you can combine it with. So the EANM guideline is there already, um, and it's limited now to after conventional therapy, not, not immediately. So there was an association in one of the trials with where you treat it with a combination, which is abiraterone or prednisone or prednisolone, where they saw increased um, fractures and mortality. And so there's still not um, enough data on that. And it's also included in the NCCN guidelines, the Bible of the oncologist pretty much. So once it's in there, it'll gain acceptance. Um, but it's also just for symptomatic fracture, fractures and you must be sure that there's no liver or lung or other involvement. Looking at thorium-227, again, a long half-life. If you see that a long half-life, it's probably best to combine it with an antibody, and this has been done with rituximab for lymphoma and trastuzumab for anything that expresses a HER2 um, receptor. HER2 expression means it's a more aggressive cancer. Um, it's often seen in breast and stomach and ovarian and colon. And so most of the work um, is in, the, in this space. As you can see, there's lots of preclinical studies, um, many of them in combination with other therapies, and only a few, a handful of clinical studies for thorium-227, and probably mostly related to um, the decay to radium-223, uh, which is a concern. So you can see the four ongoing clinical studies with thorium. And preclinical studies have shown that it is quite um, promising. So then coming to terbium, which is really, if you think about it, it's an alpha emitter and a PET agent. So giving you really the best of both worlds. This is probably the one we want, but now the production is again an issue. Um, Half-life is 4.1 hours. There's no alpha, no daughters, so recoil is not a problem. And it has been used with promise in melanoma, leukemia, and neuroendocrine, but it's in short supply. Um, and I saw this recent publication by the Swiss group showing that they have an optimized way of producing this in large quantities. Um, hopefully, hopefully we can get this soon. And astatine has um, probably the best chemical and physics properties. This is the one we could really use. I think it's a very promising one. Um, only a single alpha particle, so we don't. It simplifies our dosimetry, and there's less off target effects, flexible chemistry, we can get it from a cyclotron, stable with DOTA, and it's promising in, in multiple tumors, thyroid, neuroendocrine, and lyoma. There's also a significant timeline. If you look at this, it was probably first used, I think, in the 1950s or so. And the fact that it hasn't exploded more is, is interesting. Um, just to show you some of the clinical studies that are ongoing. 
and then led to one two. So led to one two is also creating quite a buzz right now. Um, looks like fifteen more than fifteen companies is working on this, and there are various ways of getting a, put, a generator into your department. So a generator, of course, would be wonderful because then you control the production. Um, but there's then also the need for the hot cells, etc. And this is wonderful because you can partner it with its natural um, partner, which is the lead to 203, um, and which you can image for a long time. So if you can image for 51 hours, I mean, you can look at the whole dosimetry of a time that simplifies a lot of things. Um, it has rapid normal tissue clearance and acceptable toxicity profile. And again, the kidneys may be dose limiting, but we can, we have ways of dealing with that. So we can do amino acids or gelofusin and decrease that amount of circulating um, radioactivity. So it's been used with promise in neuroendocrine tumors, prostate cancer, melanoma, um, and anything that expresses HER2 and multiple myeloma. And so just to show you some of those, um, all of them fairly recent and very promising results. And then I just wanted to summarize what the main challenges for clinicians definitely are with um, targeted alpha therapy. Um, so firstly, there's the supply, having a constant, reliable supply. Um, there's nothing worse than booking your patients for first cycles and seeing a response, and then suddenly at some point there is no supply. Um, the price of it is also a, a limiting factor. Um, a seriously limiting factor. I, I actually want to cry if I think about it. This, we had to put some of our patients now on waiting lists because our budget has run out for the for the year. Um, so supply s supply at a reasonable cost, I think, is the most important thing. If you have patients who can come in on outpatient basis, that that saves a lot of money. Actually, um, trying to motivate it to hospital managements like that because you give the treatment, the patient goes away. They don't have to stay overnight. Um, Saving costs in that regard. You don't have much toxicity. You have a good quality of life. Um, other issues that um, people in the field are working on are the chelators and how to deliver it in order to minimize the toxic effects. So you can do it in a nano molecule. Um, I hope Janke, my colleague, will speak about something like that. Um, and then where to place it in the in the treatment landscape. Do we put it early on? Do we combine it? It's it's all quite uncertain at this point. And we need prospective standardized data. Also, the waste management is a problem. We have to accept it amongst oncologists. So um, we need to be in multidisciplinary boards where we get to speak to oncologists and show them where it fits into the treatment landscape and standardization of the protocols. And so for each of them, we consider the production and the cost. How do you prepare it? Is it easy to prepare in the lab or not? Does it have an imaging partner so we can select and we can do dosimetry? Um, where are the possibilities from preclinical studies and where is the clinical need? Um, we need to look at where are the most common cancers and target those ones rather than the ones that are easier to treat. And then to come up with some good clinical guidelines. And then I almost at the end, just to show the ones that I think are most promising for various reasons, that for the generator possibilities, this one for the track record, sorry for the quality there, um, this one for the chemistry and physics, and for the flexibility. And so in future, I think we'll see, we'll sort out the problem of where exactly in the landscape we have to interchange with other specialists in the group see where we should treat and where send back to them and combine with possibly poppy and chemotherapy and when to upregulate targets. Getting bifunctional chelators would be wonderful. Um, and then some new theranostic pairs and combinations with other therapies. I thank you so much. Thanks for your attention.